research scientist in the Emerging Technologies Group, and it is my pleasure and my honor to be able to introduce Noni de la Peña to you. Um, Noni joins us. She's at uh, Emblematic, uh, which is her company down in LA. Um, and what I think is particularly unique about Noni and why I'm so excited to have her here is that Noni's work is at the intersection between uh, technology and advocacy, right? She comes from a journalism background, um, and there's a sort of critical engagement there that I think is really interesting. Um, a lot of journalism is about reporting, right? Making sure you know the facts of what's going on. What I really like about your work over the years is the way in which uh, there's the reporting what's going on, but there's the experiencing it, right? And realizing that it's not just someone else. Um, the idea that it's not just other people who are having these experiences, but they matter to you as well. And that's what I think the power of virtual reality is, right? Being able to move beyond just observing things on the screen and the feeling of immersion, the feeling that it happens to you. Um, not a lot of people negotiate that boundary necessarily uh, very well. It's a really difficult boundary to negotiate, and it's a really hard area to be in. And what I think is fabulous about Noni's work over the years is that she's gone into these areas, um, whether it's exploring Guantanamo Bay and what it's like to be a prisoner there, what it's like to be engaging with these uh, different kind of questions, all of which I think we'll probably get discussed and covered here. So, and I think uh, uh, Noni joins us at this intersection of activism and technology, which is such a Mozilla story, right? There we are in the middle of that Venn diagram. So, nobody actually wants to see me talk at all. I know this. Um, it's the face for radio that my colleague Farmaz is like likes to point out. So, um, <laughs> I'm going to hand you over to Noni and her breakout plans. Uh, thank, thank you so very much. much. Thank you for coming. Yeah, Joe Fish was. Uh, he was. We were. We were. When we met it when he was still a graduate student at Cornell, and my husband was a visiting professor there. And um, I have to say, these ideas were born during that period of time. I was just the wife, which had never been before. And um, sometimes when you're just like by yourself trying to figure out what the hell you're going to do, some weird concepts come about, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. But anyway, uh, here's a, a trailer. Can we get some audio? I'm going to have to go back. I'll start over. Let me know if you want to try that again. Sorry, a little tech thing, but I know that audio is going to come up. Apologies for being uh, here a tiny bit late. My driver kind of went the wrong direction, but that happens sometimes. You ready to try that? Here we go. The real VR pioneer, Noni de la Peña. What if I could present you a story that you remember with your entire body and not just with your mind? So what'd you think? Oh, you're crying. With VR, virtual reality, I can put you on scene in the middle of the story. You get this whole body sensation. There's a bunch of cops here. They're like standing around something's going on. Oh, right here. Ah, uh, that's not cool. On the other side of a fence, there's all these people just like kicking and beating. We can have what I call this duality of presence. A real feeling as if you are in the middle of something that you normally see on TV news. So I started applying all these ideas to what I named immersive journalism. And we all know being there is the most important part of understanding almost anything that's happening. Along in a partnership with America's premier investigative documentary series, Frontline, who had incredible access on solitary confinement cells. What that is, is photogrammetry. And it's exact photographs of a cell you are walking around the exact cell, the exact footprint. You are in the room. This works so well for putting people on scene at real stories. So then what? You gotta put the people in there. How do you do that? I can now put you in the room with somebody who is videotaped in volume. You can literally walk around them in a volumetric way. Emblematic is among the world's leading producers of virtual and augmented reality, with more than 10 years of experience. We Do you hear me now, Noni? Nice to meet you. So this is an experiment where um, I was done in Barcelona. Welcome to Barcelona. Bienvenida a Barcelona. And I'm in the body of that Noni, robot. If I could ask you to raise your arms. I would see if I check out the brazos. 
ja veieu que és la Checa. Keep them, keep them up, because now we'll show the robot. I ara anirem a veure el robot, que ja veieu. Can you move them a little bit more? A veure si els pot moure una mica més. Up and down. Doncs ja veieu que el robot reacciona perfectament amb la Noni. Noni, I'm ready to interview you now for, for a few minutes. Li farem una entrevista a la Noni per veure què li ha semblat aquesta experiència. You're a journalist, ella és una periodista, i fa una estona entrevistat un científic de Barcelona. You just interviewed a, a researcher from Barcelona, but in a, in a body of a robot. What was that experience like? So for me, it starts to feel very natural after a while. Um, occasionally, there's some problems with the, the, the eye movement if I move too fast. But beyond that, very quickly, I'm there in Barcelona with you. So that ended up uh, being published as a story about calling beaming into the news. And um, this idea of being kind of embodied uh, actually kind of comes back to like this concept of like, how, how, how did I end up in two places at once, right? Um, I grew up in Venice. I went to Venice High School. Um, that's a cage around a statue of Myrna Loy. She was, I guess, the most famous person that went to Venice High. And the senior class's, um, uh, you know, main goal every year was to somehow decapitate her, chop off her arms. That was your senior year task, right? So they put this big cage around her, and then people stuffed newspapers in there and lit it on fire, right? So um, Venice High School, because you sort of an idea of the kind of academic place I went, and somehow or other, I went from there to Harvard. And I, when I showed up at school, I'd never been on the East Coast. I showed up with a coat and boots. It was a pretty intense thing. Um, and it was the first year they were requiring basic as a programming thing that everybody had to do in order to pass out of, out of, out of your first year. And I was actually really good at it. I, and I was really, really kind of um, happy teaching people. But you know what? I just didn't have the academic prep in many ways at Harvard from Venice High. And I, I got nervous by the situation of all the guys in the room. And I, and I didn't continue until this gives you an idea of my age. CompuServe came out. Um, and I had Nani at CompuServe. And um, I won their award for the best use of the platform in which I used it for journalism. I actually tracked down uh, a lot of witnesses and, and people from the Chappaquiddick incident in which Ted Kennedy drove off a bridge and, uh, in 1968 and a young woman uh, died in the car, or maybe she was driving. That's actually the premise of our story. But that's a, another thing. But anyway, that's how I, I did a lot of research on there. It was kind of a cheap, uh, poor man's nexus. Um, and then probably like a lot of people, I read the virtual reality book by Howard Rheingold. Um, and I read that book in the early 90s when it came out. And I was like, that's what I want to do with my life. But I didn't know how. I just didn't know how I was ever going to get there. I didn't know. I just I didn't know how I was going to have the skills ever, right? Um, so, I mean, nobody said to me, like, why don't you go back to school? <laughs> I don't even know why I didn't even think about that at the time. But anyway, I, I, I had become a correspondent for Newsweek magazine. Um, I went on to make documentary films. I became a very traditional journalist. And I made this film on uh, called Unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Um, just prior to showing up uh, in Ithaca. Um, and it had a piece on all the civil liberties violations post 9-11. Um, and it had a big segment on Guantanamo Bay prison. And we had a family friend at the time who used to call up NPR and say, I really love that story on Guantanamo Bay prison. And they would go, what story? And he would go, exactly. And so, like, you know, I felt the same way that Gitmo just was not being covered. Like, young people didn't understand this. Um, and while it, and uh, up in Ithaca, I applied for a grant um, that Bay Area Video Coalition here in San Francisco and MacArthur partnered on, which was to take a existing significant documentary and turn it into a uh, into you know uh, digital media. So the first idea is, were how do you report on a destination where you're denied access? And so we built a virtual but accessible version of Gitmo uh, in Second Life, right? So originally this was built in 2007. So this gives you an idea when I started really being able to get my uh, my hands wet in, in the medium. Um, and then I had to rebuild it for Unity, because it was in Unity for the Moscow Museum of Modern Art, and it was going in in 2013. Um, so this was now like 2012, I guess, or yeah, about 2012, because it was gonna it was gonna be premiering in 2013. Uh, and at this point I'd scored a job um, uh, because of the Gitmo project as a research fellow at the USC School of Journalism, and I was doing all kinds of interesting things. But I was now determined to learn how to code. And this is a stock photo. So this was not the room I walked into at USC. This was the engineering class I walked into, 32 guys. But I was old enough and I wasn't afraid and I wasn't walking out this time. I was gonna learn how to code. Um, helped by uh, this man who gave me a professional version so I didn't have the student 
version logo on the bottom of my Unity when I presented. And um, I literally wrote it, David uh, Hickelson a letter, and he just immediately sent me a professional <coughs> copy. If you don't know who this is, he's the founder of Unity. Um, so, um, but to but to give you an idea of how we continuously look at the real journalism and imply it, this was a photo of how uh, detainees were smuggled to Gitmo, um, and this is how we put you. Um, in a, you know, we, we took control of your avatar. We had a, a HUD that let us take control of your avatar and literally throw you into this detained position and then you would end up in a camp x-ray cage. But we also really wanted to um, uh, convey the concept of habeas corpus. What does it mean to lose your habeas corpus rights? And so you were able to query this wall by, you know, asking questions like, you know, can I call my family? And, and it would respond, no, I'm sorry, you can't call your family. You know, can I call a lawyer? No, I can't call a lawyer. Can you tell me what you're in here for? I don't have that information. I mean, like, if you imagine that's your real loss of your habeas corpus right with no trial, no anything. And we tried to convey that in Second Life. I was then invited to the lab of uh, Mel Slater and Maria Sanchez Vives, who are researchers in Barcelona. Um, and um, they were working on uh, the bystander effect. Most people believe that um, because of this case, that when there's a lot of bystanders and there's a violent incident, nobody will call the police. And they were working with the researcher who had footage of closing time at the pub in England, and they were finding something quite different. That in fact, the more people were there, the more likely somebody would be to intervene. But if I stopped you from intervening, all hell would break loose. So they built this VR piece um, using really amazing audio and acting. And, and, and uh, it was my first time where I put on a headset and I realized it was in this bar where this drunk guy gets off the stool because the other guy's got on the wrong football jersey and he's ready to attack him. And I remember the sensation of being in that headset and the cable like this. I was like trying to get closer to what the fuck was going on. And that was the moment I was like, I can no longer build for my audience to be out there. They have to be in the story with me. And the amazing thing about that piece is they were accurate. Um, in fact, uh, many years later, when they revisited that story, many people did try to help. It was grossly inaccurate. So now in psychology, we have this whole idea of the bystander effect based on a case where the, re the reporting was incorrect. And this is print reporting, so just saying it's really important. While at USC, I was taking a lot of kids through Second Life, as you can imagine, and um, I decided to do some research on sexual harassment in Second Life. Um, uh, I, I was looking at, you know, um, uh, and started collecting survey monkey data. Um, and the stuff that came out of that was pretty astonishing. I was rounded up, virtually raped repeatedly, et cetera, et cetera. The third time, uh, someone attached a giant penis to my head. I couldn't get rid of it without logging out of SL. I mean, this was a, you know, kind of almost ridiculous idea of like giant penises flying around, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is what went on all the time. So um, I was looking at data, like I just wanted to look at data of how do women feel about these situations versus how men felt. In offline worlds, we find that uh, women find situations more upsetting than men do, that in uh, bulletin boards or online worlds or online based text-based things, they found things more harassing than, than, than men did. Um, and I was going to look at the same thing with women, but then I realized that I'd collected data where I had gender swapping of characters, that some characters um, would report themselves as being male but were playing with a female avatar. So indeed I found that just like in the offline world, if I compared the data of men versus women, that, that women found the situation more upsetting than men did. Um, but, um, um, sorry, I'm, I'm one behind on my slide, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, what we also found was that men were playing women. They felt more upset than the women did. So even more than the women felt harassed, men playing women. Now, I hadn't uh, started out to collect that data, um, so I didn't ask why. But, but I think that it's a really intriguing thing to take into the whole virtual reality ideas because this means that even if you swapped a gender, and there wasn't necessarily reasons why people did that, maybe they just want to check it out or whatever, um, that, that our connection to our virtual selves is incredibly strong, even on a flat screen. And that digital sense of presence um, is incredibly powerful, right? If, if just being, you know, feeling this similarity, feeling raped or harassed, right? Oh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? Sorry, wrong clue. Um, uh, digital sense of presence is quite powerful. And we are hardware to adopt ourselves as real. I show this early uh, uh, research with this guy seeing himself from behind. Um, 
in that video camera. That's what the goggles are broadcasting to. And they brought down a hammer in front of that video camera. And he jumped because he felt his body was where he was seeing himself from me, even though he could see himself ahead of that, right? More interesting, a recent study coming out of Duke, they were trying to use a brain computer interface system to train paraplegics how to control basically uh, uh, attachments to move their limbs for them. But they had this bizarre result where this envisioning of your body moving actually led to some synapses reforming. And people, it wasn't like they got up and ran out of their chairs, but what they did have was return of bodily function. They could control their bowel movements, which is a huge step forward in having a better quality of life, right? So with Mel and Mavi, I started taking all these things and we built um, this piece based on a lot of research I'd done in that original documentary uh, on a detainee who'd been uh, tortured. Uh, this was declared by the Bush administration, by everybody. There was no doubt this guy had been tortured. His name was Al-Qahtani. And um, built a VR piece um, that uh, played interrogation in the room, put you in the scene. That, by the way, is an old headset called the Y5. So you're wearing a breathing strap so that when they look in the mirror, the, the avatar is breathing at the same time they are. And um, you look down and your knees were up, right? And all the audio you're hearing in the background is an actor reading from the logs of that uh, interrogation that went for the guy who was tortured. I just changed it from an, a passive voice to an active voice, sit down, stand up. That's the breathing strap. And this is how people were, were sitting. They had their hands behind their backs, but they were sitting upright. But we asked them, what was your body like? They reported they were hunched over in a stress position. So you can imagine for us, I was like, holy shit, like, wow, this is really powerful stuff. And we published this paper, the immersive journalism paper, immersive virtual reality for the first person experience of the news. Um, uh, and I'm proud to say that the MIT Presence Journal says it's the most downloaded article that they've put out. Um, but of course, does this immersive journalism project raise ethical questions due to the subjectivity of the, of the piece? So nobody knew what went on those rooms, right? It was absolutely hidden until this video came out. Um, and it came out after we made our piece. So this was the same sit down, stand up that we were yelling in our thing in the, through the other room. And in fact, I think our piece is actually pretty accurate. So while at um, USC, uh, th there was a at class I was working on a, what now would be kind of a traditional web news journalism piece uh, called Hunger in the Golden State. And it used web video and photographs and audio, et cetera. And I wanted to build a VR piece. So now we're talking about uh, well, this published in March of 2010, so before I published, and I held up my hand and said, anybody want to do VR with me to the students? And nobody raised their hand. So at the end, I got a, um, a, a professor at uh, UC Irvine, who I'd come and given a talk to like this, um, and said, I want to build this hunger piece. And she, she said, stay here, stay here. She ran home and got her just graduated from high school daughter, brought her to me and said, she'll be your intern. And, um, and so between Michaela Kopp's Mark and I, um, we started recording audio at food banks until she was at this long line here and this man with diabetes did not get food in time and he dropped into a diabetic coma. And she came back to my office with the audio and she was just crying. And that's when I was like, I've got to build with this, right? Oh, you're not going to play for me? I'm going to move to the next one. There's too many people. There's too many anyway, people. Okay. Uh, you can hear the audio, the audio in the background. I had 700 bucks of my own money. Uh, so I had no one to support on this project. So I had virtual humans donated. Okay. Um, uh, okay. And I was working still, managed to get a weasel into a lab at USC with equipment. Um, and if you'll see, you know, for that guy, that's Alejandro Gonzalez in too, if you know the director of Birdman Revenant, who I introduced to VR at this moment, this is spring of 2012. And you'll see, he's not gonna walk, step on the guy. He's gonna be really careful yeah, yeah, yeah. not to step on this invisible body at his feet, right? Because for him, he's there, he's in the room. 
So that piece got into the January of 2012 Sundance. It said the first piece at Sundance. And again, here are the wide five goggles, $50,000 a pair. The head of the lab was like, you're not taking those anywhere. So we had to make goggles. Um, uh, and here we are trying to get something together. Um, and some of the biggest unsung here on the corner there is Ty Fan. Um, and this kid down below, I'll talk a little bit more about if you don't already know. We showed up with goggles that look like this. Um, and this was opening night. And I had no idea how people were going to react at all. Um, so she's down on the ground, like with the seizure victim, trying to talk to him. She's incredibly upset. She's the one who comes out crying. Um, um, and this happened just over and over again all throughout the festival. Another look at that, those goggles, uh, PFR HMD, signed Palmer Lucky. Uh, he was crashed in my hotel room. I'd been like the lab uh, intern. And um, uh, nine months later, um, he went on to start the Oculus Rift. Uh, three years later, two and a half years later, before he was even old enough to drink, I think he sold it for $3 billion to Facebook. And um, we ended up with the cover of Time magazine and the most uh, memed, parodied cover of Time magazine. Um, but I do have to, I do have to strike a note here, which is that in that virtual reality article, not a single woman was mentioned. So this continues, right? Not one woman in that cover story. So that's Oculus number 154. Um, but you can see I did something that probably really destroyed its resale value historically. I stapled trackers onto it because the original Oculus um, uh, sat you in a chair and um, you could look at video or whatever. I wanted to keep walking around. That sense of people being down on the ground, trying to hold somebody's head, that to me felt like the most real place to go, right? Um, so we started 3D printing our own goggles. We started making our own controllers and I'm gonna show you a video about that, but it meant that I had to use this $100,000 motion tracking equipment that I managed to pick up at a, at a, at a, um, a bankruptcy sale for, um, $7,000. So what did I do with it? Uh, I told the story of this man, uh, Anastasio Hernandez Rojas. Uh, he was brought to the United States as a young boy, um, had never been in trouble with the law, been a mother's day during the downturn. He stole a bottle of uh, tequila and a steak for his wife. And um, he was deported, uh, caught, deported, and then beaten up by, roughed up by a border patrol agent. And then he complained, because he'd been in the US long enough, he complained about bad treatment. And instead, the supervisor sent him to a dark pen where two people captured really incredible audio, despite the fact that um, the Border Patrol was going around and confiscating uh, cell phones and video cameras from the scene. Um, we took the piece to BuzzFeed because um, at this point, uh, you know, distribution was pretty hard. And this will get a little bit more uh, audio in just a second. I don't even know what these are. I guess cameras. Looks like somebody's gonna shock me. That guy's holding a lightsaber back there. I think virtual reality really is like the next big thing. I think it's the new video game or whatever that means. It's so weird. There's like all these people and I'm like, what is about to happen? How's this look with my hair? Pretty good, right? Oh, got it. That has equipment, right? This is gonna simulate a cell phone, so it's gonna mm -hmm. be when you press this button here yeah. and you hold it up in front of you, a cell phone will appear and you'll have 60 seconds to record whatever you want until you, before your battery dies. Oh, I see. Oh my God. That's even crazier. All right, so there's a bunch of cops here. They're like standing around, something's going on. Oh, right here. Oh, that's not cool. Like on the other side of a fence, there's all these people just like kicking and beating this man and he's screaming. Look at this, and nobody's doing anything about it. Of course nobody's doing anything about it, right? Of course, because that's what people do, they just watch. It's kind of messed up. Oh, here we go. I couldn't tell before, but I think he's handcuffed. I'm looking above, I'm seeing the, the horror. Hey, we're, we're recording you. Already not moving, but there's like five dudes beating them. Same thing, they just are not stopping. So you can see they're very deeply into it, even though the graphics are so low quality, right? Because I can have low, low budget. I don't know. I mean, I just, I can't believe that that 
like is real? I uh, did not expect a recreation of a real life beating. Said I thought it was going to be some sort of, uh, possibly some uh, you know entertaining game. That was that was not the case. You feel kind of like helpless and isolated. Hopefully in that situation you actually would be able to like somehow stop it, but I do think like the next best thing is recording it. I wonder what I would really do. Like what, I know you want to say stuff, it's okay to say stuff, but it's like you, I don't have the power to go and arrest the police. It's, maybe that's problematic. I think when you see something like that, you're like, wow, that was horrible, but at least like the one comfort that I have is like, the United States justice system will do something about it and like people that do bad things get punished for that. And then like what we've been seeing the past few weeks is like sometimes that doesn't happen. The thing that was really sort of dis disorienting is that it wasn't one cop doing it and his partner, it was all these other cops sort of standing around and watching. I think every police officer in the United States probably needs to experience what I just experienced. I think everyone should give this a shot. And it should not only be for entertainment. I think there should be a whole universe of stuff that we can use this for. And this is definitely something I didn't consider at all. And it's really effective. So that case, which had gotten barely any attention in the press through that distribution, unusual distribution, right, coming under the web, um, had 900, and, uh, you know, almost a million views on a case that otherwise had gotten zero attention, right? Um, and it had pages and pages of discussion about race in America, although I, I have to admit it wasn't fun to find this one. Damn, I Googled use of force VR, expecting someone being a Jedi in VR, not what I expected. So um, just to give you an idea of how the piece was created, the woman who captured this uh, crucial video that showed how many officers were involved and how they just didn't stop beating him, um, uh, you know, they, they, she snuck her, her uh, uh, video camera out um, and I brought her down to the lab very bravely. She got, she got a lot of help for releasing this stuff, but I brought her down to the USC lab where we scanned her so that I could motion capture as well and put her in with her whole body, using her whole body as a witness, yelling the same thing she's yelled, doing the same actions, pulling her thing out, leaning over the fence. So when you're in the piece, she's standing next to you. And the concept was, how do we take a witness and let them tell their story with their whole body instead of just sitting on the screen flat and saying, and then this happened and then that happened, right? I was then asked to make a piece about a uh, project uh, about Syria. Um, and this is a little trailer to give you an idea of uh, what we made. we do this with very detailed art bibles we were really careful to make sure anything that we reproduced digitally had a source in the physical world even down to the rubble after the explosion it was really carefully made right um to stay with some sort of journalistic integrity right to show that thing that we felt was so crucial and which is the world Ec economic forum uh, peter gabriel john mccain saw it the incredible uh, Syrian contingent. But I think um, for me, one of the most important moments, it got taken to the Victorian Albert Museum in London and they didn't advertise it. And they put us in the tapestries room. Again, you can see the kind of gear we were up, we were had to travel with. Um, and uh, you know the old uh, storytelling against this crazy new technology. But after um, five days, we ended up with 54 pages of guest book comments. And um, people's reactions was incredible. We were told by curators that they hadn't ever seen this kind of an outpouring um, on any of their pieces. Absolutely fascinating. A real feeling if you're in the middle of something you normally see on TV news. Um, empathy for global citizens, quite frightening. You saw what my graphics were like, right? Which is why sometimes I really argue there's no such thing as the Uncanny Valley. I think it's behavioral realism. I just have a, a, a paper that I just published on that. It's more important. And finally, I read you one of her quotes this was a very difficult piece to experience as a Syrian whose family is still living in alms. I felt the piece was inappropriate at first. I've certainly changed my mind after experiencing it firsthand. It's important for the world to bear witness to the situation in Syria, and this is a powerful and a, an effective way to do that. This piece uh, still resonates. I, 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 it's a story of a 
Two sisters unsuccessful attempt to rescue a third sister from a fatal attack by an ex-boyfriend. Three women a day are killed by their former partners or partners, usually by a handgun, almost entirely by a handgun. Um, and um, two, the two sisters both called 911 and they had an open audio track. So I could use the audio to also recreate the piece. And again, to show you how we tried to uh, really be uh, uh, clear about what we were making, um, you know, on the left are the real photographs, on the right are the digital things that we produced. Um, we made a decision um, not to show any of the blood and gore, even though we had it from a Freedom of Information Act. Um, but uh, uh, with the sisters' help, we recreated the whole scene, and now you're there. And I've had multiple people say to me, I've never been in a room with someone with a gun before, and it's a really, really intense piece. Um, and the key is last sounds I live with, but three women a day, um, uh, it's just way too many. Um, <clears throat> then we worked on a piece that puts you on the, you have to cross into a healthcare clinic and deal with the kind of stuff that young women do uh, when they have to uh, try to get healthcare at places like Planned Parenthood. Um, we scanned people, we're trying to have some realism, and then what we did is we put real audio into the scene. This guy is going to lip sync the audio that we then put onto the character. You're a whore. You're a whore. You're a whore. You're a little whore. How about stop being a whore? You whore, shame on you. Start closing your legs. Start having some respect for your body. Maybe your parents should have aborted you. Remember that's all lip sync. Um, and that piece, by the way, uh, uh, Planned Parenthood took it into a uh, couple of uh, areas where uh, anti-abortion areas. And the result was that people uh, came out after seeing the piece saying they didn't think it was right for young women to experience that kind of abuse and vitriol. And uh, they would even vote for people who would try to stop that from happening, those kind of protests. Didn't mean they changed their views on abortion, but there was a common bridge found, which I think, given the polarization, uh, it's really important for us to be seeking this out all the time. Um, this is a piece, a pretty extraordinary piece about 40% uh, of uh, homeless youth in America come from the LGBTQ community. And um, this is a story of a kid who walked into his family that had a religious intervention going and they ended up, um, uh, he refused to back down and they ended up assaulting him and he ended up homeless. Um, and uh, with his um, uh, very careful uh, notes and et cetera, I had to reproduce the entire scene. Um, but we also started making these holograms to, um, and these are holograms of transgender folks who managed to come back up from being homeless to, um, to uh, 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 you know, they, 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 found some, they found a place in their lives which allowed them to um, uh, give messages of hope. Uh, just a little bit more about like those crazy goggles that we we're using and some of the fun stuff we did and kind of unique groundbreaking things. Um, we were invited to the uh, Formula One uh, Singapore by Standard Charter Bank, and we made this networked experience with our goggles. Um, and first it let you, oh, I thought I went through this already. Shoot. Grant access, thank you. Uh, we went through the pit crew. And um, uh, after you, um, you know, got to go to the pit crew and you'd see somebody else racing against you, um, then you got to uh, race uh, against that person. You literally went from being in the pit crew and then you got into a, 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 a tracked car. Right so, and had a leaderboard. So again, we're still making our own goggles at this point, but we were doing multiple people in the, in the experience. <laughs> so this is 2013, I guess. Quick word on kinematic, what I call kinematic versus cinematic VR. Um, you've been looking at all our kinematic work, the walk around. Um, cinematic work um, is what you will put on your phones and um, uh, shooting with multiple cameras. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very beautiful and photo real. This is something we do with the BBC in Calais. Um, and um, uh, there we go. And this is a piece we shot in the, in the Nuba Mountains wow. in Sudan. Wow. Six of them. The longest the running war there. Us, um, get this and it's, again, that's all real video, so it can be very, very beautiful, right? And it was a very intense piece to shoot. So 
So on scene with the 360 camera, right? Um, but as we've moved more into photogrammetry, if you're uh, familiar with the, not familiar with the process, on the left is a series of photographs, and on the right is how they become algorithmically stitched together to make a model. And that's what we did in this solitary shell. I had the guys from Realities IO, uh, one of the founders of that company, went into this solitary shell up in Maine for us that we got access because of Frontline partnership together. And you take many, 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 many photographs of every element in that room. And then you can literally look under the bed. So this is a real cell in, um, in, uh, in Maine. Um, you're looking at actually the uncleaned up version. There's not a lot of cleaning up yet. There's still holes and patches in the wall. And then we started using uh, uh, the volumetric capture technology I mentioned briefly. We got a guy who spent four and a half years in that cell. We brought him down to the 8i studios where he shot with multiple, multiple video cameras and then it's stitched together. I know Microsoft has opened up a studio here for similar technologies. Um, I heard about another really exciting one. So this volumetric capture is just starting. Um, and then we dropped that when guy into, into the cell myself, so he could tell a story that, and you could be in the room with him. Years of my life in solitary confinement. I look fine, but I'm not. 18 years old, I was new to the system, never really been in trouble before. As an adult, the solitary confinement and the sensory deprivation, years of it, drove a relatively sane young When you're in the goggles on this, insane. you are walking around so with him, right? He's in the room next to you. Over and over and over and over, I acted out. I so the um, we then and also, as you can tell, it's in a 360 a video things, form here. We rendered it out into 360 and put it up on Facebook and got 2 million views. Again, right now, we understand what the distribution limitations are, so we work any way that we can. I was then asked by a bipartisan committee looking into the establishment of a women's history museum on the mall in DC um, to put a VRP together for the report going in, requesting that they be allowed to uh, set up a raise money for a museum. Um, I picked this badass woman printer. She was a newspaper editor as well. Um, and she published the first uh, official declaration of independence. And um, uh, when I say that, it's because before it was treason to put your names on it. And she actually, at the very bottom there, it says printed by Mary Catherine Goddard. She never put her full name on anything she published before then. So she literally signed the Declaration of Independence. And she was so badass that when she died in, two, in uh, 1816, she freed her slave and left her all her money. Uh, but again, uh, zero budget. So what do you do? I need a historical printing press, right? An area to make it look like you're really in her space. And um, fortunately, Historic Deerfield let us come in and shoot photogrammetry. This is the point cloud data that then, you know, we, we cleaned up. And, and now you're in the room in that uh, historic Deerfield. But now it seems like you've been transported back using that AI technology. Another trick we did is we shot in Greenland, a big piece in Greenland. We took a 360 camera. We clamped it to the edge of an Ozo helicopter and we filmed over Greenland. And then what we did is we took that video and we put it on the and sphere and put a uh, uh, um, helicopter just like it was shot on um, so that you are now inside the helicopter and you are flying over Greenland. And it's surprisingly effective at, at, at um, it has much, much better um, rates of lack of nausea than I've had with any other kind of moving video, because I usually tell people to lock the camera down with 360 video, because if you move the camera and the person feels like they're sitting still, that disconnect or inner ear says you're not moving and your eyes are saying you're moving, that's the number one, number one reason you make people nauseous. So with being inside a fixed space like this, I've had more success, although even so people find it a little woozy sometimes. But working with new people who are new to this, this kind of technology, they didn't capture all the photogrammetry I needed. Um, and this was a flat video. But we still needed the scene. So we had to dimensionalize a photograph, right? Uh, and make it photo real, but it still got dimension. And then we drop, dropped in the 8 eye shot uh, holograms of the NASA scientists. Uh, just be aware, interesting ethical question. If What is he going to wear, right? His... Uh, uh, if he's being shot in a green screen, you don't put him in a big parka because then it's as if he's been on shot actually at the 
at the glacier. We had to go back and forth, like, what's the right thing for him to wear? We're not tricking people, but it looks right for the scene. Very interesting and new question ethically in journalism. Um, and again, we also dimensionalize things like underwater. Um, uh, these are a tiny bit dark, unfortunately, but um, what they are are a very inexpensive green screened video capture. We just drop a green screen around somebody so that they're actually on a card, but we put them in dimensionalized scenes and they are um, uh, Holocaust survivors, right? And the reason we're doing that, putting them in dimensionalized scenes from where they got picked up, um, and it feels very real if you put it in, in the right place and it feels like they've got dimension because it's volumetric around them. Um, uh, uh, it's inexpensive and, it, and it's working. And we just got a, a $250,000 grant to start making a platform to let people film their own stories, their interviews themselves. And we'll be providing volumetric locations that you can drop the stories into. And I'm hoping that's gonna be a Mozilla partnership on that one um, because uh, this will be web-based. We'll need your help guys on that. Uh, how do we survive uh, some branded work? Uh, uh, we decided we want to do a time-lapse, uh, volumetric time-lapse, and Cartier had just bought this old uh, mansion, and so we dimensionalized this so that you're um, standing on 1910, uh, 1970, and then the present Fifth Avenue, um, and uh, it actually is really, really beautiful. It works really, really well. Um, we also work uh, in AR and VR. Uh, we built this uh, very interesting app uh, in partnership with the Wall Street Journal. It does a live stream of data from the stock market, uh, gives you visualizations that then you can drill down into. Um, uh, and I think getting seeing spatialized data, it's like looking at a dinner table. You don't have to count how many plates or knives or forks or cups, you see it in one glance, but you can also discern the pattern, how many people are coming for dinner. And I think spatialized data is really, really important. Um, this was a really fun piece I got to work on with an artist named Lin Lin, who literally crossed that brick wall across the street, brick by brick on a busy street with cars honking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we rebuilt that in VR where now you have to cross the uh, bricks yourself across a busy street. Um, and it was a way to reproduce a performance art piece um, with the Asia Art Archive and ended up at Art Basel in Hong Kong. A little bit more fun. Um, great rock and roll hotel room trashings, right? And so we're building a, a game that Slash is emceeing for, and it lets you be on scene at some of the most incredible antics, uh, uh, cars and swimming pools, TVs over balconies, um, uh, and uh, who wouldn't want to be there for the madness? Um, I mean, the stories are incredible. Uh, he wouldn't travel without a cord long enough to plug in his, uh, his uh, chainsaw on the road, yeah. Uh, and what's fun about this piece is that it also can be multiplayer because you can't nail a bed to the ceiling without your friends. Uh, uh, finally, um, I'm gonna wrap up the story just for, for um, women uh, in particular, but all of you there too, to help women feel comfortable when they walk into those rooms. Uh, the Founders Forum is this event for startups that I was invited to come in and ha go to a small, um, 13, it was like maybe 15 person lunch with Prince William, Eric Schmidt, um, uh, Jimmy Wales, um, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then like, I'm like, what am I doing here, right? And the one of the Prince's handlers sat me basically with Eric, the Prince. I was in the with Jimmy Wales and I would have been right here. And I got really nervous and I did not lean in. I went down to the end of the table and I sat facing no one. So don't do what I did because I regret every second of having done that. And it's just this nervousness, but I just asked for the guys in the room, like if you see a woman walk in to the situation, was it powerful like that? Help them, lead them to a chair, have their back, talk to them. We need to do that. It's really important part of all this. And you know, uh, we know that most guys are wonderful and that the few that have been in the news lately are, are not representative at all of the majority of people. And together we can, we can make a really cool world. That's it. I'm open for questions. Great. So we can take questions in any of the rooms or certainly in Slack, speaker dash series, or in Air Mozilla and IRC. Um, we may have a question in Mountain View, I believe. So, Mountain View. 
please step up to the microphone. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, this is Emma Humphreys, uh, Firefox Team Bugmaster. Uh, Nani, it's really great to see you talk about the early work you did in Second Life. I was at Linden Lab during that period where you were doing the Guantanamo work. Um, the question I have is, you mentioned Palmer Lucy, and Palmer Lucy took those billions that he got for selling Oculus to Facebook and immediately started a company to make memes to support white supremacists and white nationalists. Um, you've been showing us examples of using virtual reality and in multiple techniques in order to build empathy for underrepresented groups and groups that are oppressed. How do we deal with that, the, um, that white supremacists, uh, the groups called the alt-right, and others have been very successful at taking the platforms that we've built over the past 30 years and using it to radicalize people to violence and to uh, vote for white supremacists. So first I'll say, uh, as you can imagine, um, when Palmer and Peter Thiel announced that they were gonna join a, have a company to do surveillance, create surveillance equipment for the border, and the fact that I had been deposed in the, uh, a couple of times, I asked for incredible laundry list of stuff from the period of time when we worked together um, so that they, they could win their IP portion of the Carmack uh, lawsuit, uh, uh, if you guys followed any of that. So I'd have to def had to defend, to defend him because basically he, I think he did have the rights to the IP and certainly I had a lot of documentation, photographs, et cetera, et cetera. But then for him and Peter Thiel to go off and do the border surveillance project, um, it was difficult uh, to say the least, because of course my families are Mexican American immigrants. Um, uh, my grandparents did not have papers because the border was very porous and they started the first, they were very industrious people. They started the very first Mexican bakery in Fresno and blah, blah, blah. And my, you know, I ended up at Harvard. My sister went to Stanford. I mean, like, you know, anyway, whatever the immigrant story. So one of the things I'm going to do is when I do that, that platform is I'm going to be scanning um, spaces along the border, among other things. And I'm a new America fellow this year um, uh, to uh, actually focus on some of the border issues um, and provide people the opportunity to tell their stories. Right. That's something that I'm, you know, can do. Um, of course, you, you cued me for this next slide, which is I've also joined the Aspen Institute Nine Foundation Commission on Trust, Media and Democracy. And we're trying to, in fact, uh, uh, confront some of these exact questions that you're asking um, uh, and look at what are some of the root causes and, and think about what does it mean to um, you know, identify the parental and emerging values and social obligations should guide those who produce, distribute, and consume news. So um, just a couple of things. Trust, you should know uh, that this is a slide on, on how, uh, I can't believe you cued this for me so perfectly, but trust um, has declined uh, over many years since the 1970s. Um, uh, public school, that was government, public schools from 62% to 75% to 31%, medical system, 80% to 37%, and et cetera, et cetera. The only ones that have increased are been a bit small businesses and the military, which was so bad in the 19, after the Vietnam War, right? Um, but it's also mirrored in income inequality, um, very similar uh, uh, pattern, um, but it's not the whole picture. As you write, um, most students don't know when news is fake. There was a recent Stanford study just showing how incredibly um, much kids don't check their sources, right? So what are the solutions for critical thinking? Um, and I think a really interesting question is, should advertisers be part of this fix? Because that's where the money goes, right? And unfortunately, money is what helps a lot of things get greased. And I'm wondering, could uh, we have some sort of tax benefit if, 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 if advertisers help fund, you know, journalism organizations, which were decimated by the drive of the money away from uh, news organizations to like Facebook and Google? Um, uh, and similarly, should news organizations be, um, uh, uh, you know, allowed tax write-offs? So just quickly finishing up, you know, uh, France did do this best to do fake news uh, restraints during the election. This was a fake 
poll, and they definitely worked pretty hard at, at trying to combat some stuff. So I think with some awareness, hopefully um, that fake news thing can also lead to uh, a deeper understanding of, of critical thinking. And um, just to say that some of these issues are not new. If you remember, this is the, uh, the war room in which Hillary Clinton um, was watching the capture of Osama bin Laden, but in the Middle East and other places where they don't have women and men in the room, they photoshopped her out. Um, and um, so, you know, um, uh, photo issue of, of, you know, how do we, how do we regain trust is going to be, um, hopefully we can think about some of the lessons we learned on this and think about how we can, um, uh, 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 you know, restore some of the trust that has made some of those groups angry and radicalized. So we had that was a long answer, but you ha I, I put this away. I wasn't going to even talk about this, but then you set it up. <laughs> no, this is very good. Um, we had two questions come in through IRC, Slack, and I'm going to combine them. They're related. So one, um, curious if Nani has a sense of whether there are specific subjects or themes that are best suited for VR journalism. Um, or is it just, is it neutral, any kind of topic? And related to that, is anyone specifically working on bringing VR recreations of crime scenes into the courtroom? Um, courtroom answer is yes, but I'll just let you Google that. Um, there's been some stuff on that. Um, uh, and I don't remember their names, but indeed people have been thinking about it for courtrooms. Absolutely. Um, and the other um, uh, uh, the question was on what kind of news does best in VR. I get asked this question a lot. And I think that um, we, we're finishing up a study with USC on our three frontline pieces. And we are finding that people find the embodied experience the most um, powerful, but because we'd rendered it out into the 360 video and also into flat screen regular, um, people sometimes retain the data a little better than when they're in the embodied thing, because their body's so involved, they're not remembering all the numbers or some of the data. So I think we're still not at a point yet with VR where we should be trying to really do um, in-depth um, um, data pieces, um, unless we start thinking about that spatial data as part of the embodiment. So um, I think, you know, st I, for me, I, I, the way that I always start a piece and think about a piece is I literally, I close my eyes, I imagine my body in the space, and then I start thinking about how would I tell my, that story with my body in the space. Um, no, I'd like to ask a sort of prosaic question. I, I, I have a list of like 12 that I came up with during your, your talk, but I want to pick um, a specifically Mozillian one and be kind of selfish here. Um, we have a goal in emerging technologies for mixed reality, which is to create the preferred user agents for the open 3D internet, right? That's what we, we think that there is a lot of value in having open standards for this kind of thing so that as many people as possible can experience stuff. We think that nobody wants to get into a VHS Betamax fight, right? Like nobody wins one of those fights. And if we can make VR so that anyone on any headset can experience it, um, there seems to be value in, in having those open standards, much as the 2D web, which we just call the web, has been. What do you see as the barriers to that? What are the things that we're missing? What's the stuff that makes that hard? Um, and what are the limitations of that approach that, that may be missing out stuff that your particular approach to using VR has called, is valuable for? Um, so, um, you know, my sense on that is like the ubiqu you know, ubiquitous of the technology right now, it's still a little ways to go, right? Um, but that that is even that's going fast and furious, right? We've got all the six off headsets coming out this this year for, for holiday season purchases, and everybody's involved at Dell, um, Qualcomm, um, Microsoft. Um, we have quite a few of them kicking around our, my studio. Um, so um, I think that what you're interested in is crucial. It's imperative. Um, and all of us are going to die if we don't have that kind of a collaborative, cooperative um, approach. Yeah. Um, it's just not going to get where we need it to go. Um, and I think there's so much room here that there's no reason why it can't be open like that. Uh, I just, I just, you know, I, I don't know how Zuckerberg feels about recouping his three billion dollar investment. Um, my, um, 
you know, my sense is that one of the people talk about VR uh, having a slight trough of disappointment right now. Um, and I would suggest that's because um, they really pushed 360 video and um, 360 video is easy to shoot and uh, easy to make bad. So a lot of people saw bad VR and they're like, this is what they're hyping about. Ugh. Um, and I think that if they'd been a little bit more thinking about not how to recoup that dollars today, um, and not the hyping, but thinking a little bit more in the longer term structure, that uh, I think it also would have helped their bottom line. One more time for one more question in San Francisco. Should I just throw the box at you? Can you hear me? Um, so I really loved how you have taken real life sound recordings and um, combined them with these virtual environments to kind of recreate something from the past. Um, and I was curious if you've explored the olfactory sense and tactile, like within VR. And also my second question is what does VR mean for someone who is visually impaired? And like, could you potentially I'm right, asked that second question a lot that last because um, uh, so visually impaired, but like, what about being deaf, right? Same question, right? So I had somebody who was deaf go through Project Syria, right? And so I thought, well, it's CG, but it's the it's the sound, which really, and I feel like a lot of sound drives these things. And I thought for sure the sound was the meaningful thing. But after she went through it, she, went, she and I had this back and forth on Twitter. She was floored. So, so there's something else there too. So the sound will take you through. If you're if you if you're visually impaired, but obviously the visuals take you through. If you're deaf, there is there is something unique about this medium that we are just beginning to understand. Um, uh, and the part one of your question is, what do we do about haptics and smell? I think haptics are going to be um, uh, rapidly evolving. Um, uh, pressure sensor gloves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's already stuff out there. Um, I remember early on, somebody would let you. Um, uh, wear like a vest and then you could, or a thing, I don't know, was it close? I can't remember. You could hug a chicken. It was a very funny thing or like the chicken on the other side would feel your hug. It was, a, it was my favorite early, yeah, yeah. The fairly early research on hugging a chicken, but but not to make a joke about that, but but because I think it will happen and we all know, of course, it's gonna happen with pornography. That is a definite, definite, definite. Um, I talk about, you know, like porn and taxes, obviously the Rosetta Stone with the tax document, we're gonna see taxation in VR too. Um, but um, but uh, smell is a tough one because um, do I really want to smell um, in Syria the this, this smell of the bombing going off? Or, you know, there are a lot of people getting into scent collars and things. And I'm, and I'm, I'm think some of them will be great, you know, nice to smell some lemons and oranges when you're walking down a grove. But I'm not sure I want to smell the, you know, burnt flesh in journalism. Sorry, that's my truth. Yes. On that lovely note, I think we're concluded. <laughs> thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate everybody watching from afar. And thank you so much for having me. Okay, so these were these your doctors? Yeah. Okay. Awesome.